The humerus articulates with the scapula to form the glenohumeral joint and the radius and ulna to form the elbow joint. The humerus is divided into a proximal end, a shaft, and a distal extremity. The proximal end consists of a head, the anatomic neck, the greater and lesser tubercles, the intertubricular groove, and the surgical neck. And in this video, we're going to use a right humerus. The head faces medial and articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the glenohumeral joint, which is described as a polyaxial ball and socket synovial joint. However, orthopedic surgeons will often describe it as a ball and flat surface joint, in which the head of the humerus is applied to the glenoid cavity as opposed to being cupped into the cavity the way the femoral head is to the acetabulum. The articular surface of the humeral head is about four times larger than the glenoid cavity which allows for more mobility, but it also makes the joint more unstable. The joint is surrounded by a weak fibrous capsule that attaches to the neck, except inferiorly, where the attachment is more distal at the surgical neck. The inferior part of the joint capsule is the weakest area. Overall, it is a relatively unstable joint and is good to be familiar with what is known as a hill sacs lesion which is a compression fracture of the posterior lateral portion of the head. The mechanism of injury is anterior dislocation of the shoulder joint. The anatomic neck surrounds the head. It separates the head from the tubercles and is the attachment site of the glenohumeral joint capsule. The surgical neck is distal to the tubercles. It separates the upper end of the humerus from the shaft. There is no groove that clearly delineates the surgical neck. The reason it's called the surgical neck is because fractures commonly occur here. And when fractures do occur, the axillary nerve and the posterior humeral circumflex vessels may be injured. The greater tubercle is located lateral to the head. It has three areas that serve as attachment sites for muscles, a superior, middle, and inferior. The supraspinatus attaches to the superior facet, the infraspinatus to the middle, and the teres minor to the inferior. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, along with the subscapularis, makes up what is known as the rotator cuff muscle group. And this group of tendons functions to provide stability to the glenohumeral joint. Now in terms of function, the tendon of the long head of the biceps can be considered part of the tendinous cuff because it, assi because it assists the cuff muscles in stabilizing the humeral head, but anatomically it is not included. There is a similar finding in the foot. The tendon of the flexor hallucis longus courses in between the sesamoids, however anatomically it is not considered part of the sesamoid apparatus, but functionally it does help to stabilize the first metatarsophalangeal joint. The lesser tubercle projects anterior and is medial to the bicipital groove. The subscapularis inserts into the lesser tubercle. The intertubricular groove, also known as the bicipital groove, faces anterior. It is located between the greater and lesser tubercles. The groove consists of a medial and lateral lip and a floor. The teres major inserts into the medial lip and the pectoralis major inserts into the lateral lip. The latissimus dorsi inserts into the floor. The transverse humeral ligament extends from the greater to lesser tubercle and it forms a canal or tunnel through which the tendon of the long head of the biceps courses through. Something interesting about the biceps brachii is that it usually has two origins or two heads and in about 10% of people there are three origins and when present that third head arises from the brachialis. The shaft, also known as the body, begins at the surgical neck and it consists of three borders, the anterior, medial and lateral, three surfaces, anterolateral, anteromedial and posterior and it has two prominent features, the deltoid tuberosity and the radial groove. The humerus consists of two muscular compartments, 
The anterior or flexor compartment contains three muscles, biceps brachii, brachialis, and caracobrachialis. Three nerves, median, ulnar, and musculocutaneous, and the brachial artery along with its vena comatans. The posterior compartment contains two muscles, triceps and the anconius, and the radial nerve and the profunda brachii artery. The medial border extends from the lesser tubercle to the medial supracondylar ridge. The proximal third contains the medial lip of the bicipital groove, which is the insertion of the teres major. The middle part contains a rough impression for the caracobrachialis. The caracobrachialis serves a similar function to, and thus is a counterpart to the adductor muscle group in the thigh, because the caracobrachialis adducts the humerus. The lateral border begins at the greater tubercle and ends at the lateral supracondylar ridge. The middle portion of the lateral border contains the deltoid tuberosity, which is the insertion of the deltoid muscle. The anterior border separates the anterior surface into the anterior lateral and anterior medial surfaces. The lower halves of the anterior lateral and anterior medial surfaces is a flat, smooth, a slightly concave area which gives rise to the brachialis muscle. The posterior surface is nearly completely covered by the lateral and medial heads of the triceps brachii. The lateral head originates proximal to the radial groove and the medial head originates distal to the radial groove. The radial groove provides a path for the radial nerve and the profunda brachii artery. The supracondylar ridges form the sharp borders of the distal humerus. The medial supracondylar ridge consists of an anterior, posterior, and intermediate lip. The anterior lip provides origin for a portion of the brachialis muscle. The posterior lip provides origin for a portion of the medial head of the triceps, and the medial intermuscular septum attaches to the intermediate lip. The medial intermuscular septum is pierced by the ulnar nerve and the ulnar collateral artery. The lateral supracondylar ridge provides origin for the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus muscles. The brachioradialis originates from the upper two thirds and the extensor carpi radialis longus from the lower one third. The lateral intermuscular septum attaches to the lateral supracondylar ridge and is pierced by the radial nerve and the profunda brachii artery. The supracondylar ridges end as a prominent medial and lateral epicondyles. The medial epicondyle is larger. It has a smooth groove which is a sulcus for the ulnar nerve. The anterior compartment of the forearm consists of a superficial and deep muscular compartment. The superficial compartment contains five muscles and the tendons of these five muscles fuse and form what is known as a common flexor tendon and this attaches to the medial epicondyle. The superficial muscles are the pronator teres, flexor car carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, and the humeral head of the flexor digitorum superficialis. The posterior compartment of the forearm is also divided into a superficial and deep group of muscles. The superficial group has four muscles that originate from the lateral epicondyle, and the tendons of these muscles fuse to form what is known as a common extensor tendon. These muscles are the extensor digitorum, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, and extensor digiti minimi. Also, the anconius originates from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle. I think a really helpful way to understand the distal extremity is to divide this region into anterior and posterior, and articular versus non-articular. The articular parts are the capitulum and the trochlea. The capitulum only faces anterior, but the trochlea faces anterior and a portion of it faces posterior. The capitulum is a lateral portion and it articulates with the head of the radius and the trochlea articulates with the trochlear notch of the ulna 
and you'll notice that the trochlea projects further distal. As for the non-articular areas, there are three fat-filled depressions, or fossae, the olecranon, radial, and coronoid. The olecranon is located posterior, and the radial and coronoid are located anterior. The depression above the capitulum is the radial fossa, and the depression above the trochlea is a coronoid fossa. The radial and coronoid fossae work when the elbow is flexed. The radial fossa accommodates the radial head in a flexed elbow, and the coronoid fossa accommodates the ulna in a flexed elbow. The olecranon fossa is located above the posterior aspect of the trochlea, and it accommodates the olecranon process of the ulna in an extended elbow. The elbow joint capsule attaches to the shaft above the radial and coronoid fossa anteriorly and to the margins of the olecranon fossa posteriorly. There are two collateral ligaments, the radial or lateral and the ulnar or medial and these attach to the lateral and medial epicondyles. Stability of the elbow joint depends largely on the integrity of the collateral ligaments.